Okay, uh, good afternoon. Let's be seated. Uh, there are a few chairs on the sides and there are some chairs here also which you can use. And yeah, if you don't mind, uh, before the pandemic, that's what students used to do. They would have no problems in sitting on the floor. Um, so before we get started, um, I must mention that uh, generally when we get speakers to speak in this hall uh, in the last seven to eight years, usually we have got uh, practicing lawyers, sometimes sitting judges, occasionally ministers, which is normally not our choice. But um, today we have a person actually who connects different fields. So uh, Mr. Arun Mehra kindly agreed to visit the campus today. And uh, as you must have seen from the short description that was circulated by the public policy group, uh, his experience actually cuts across different lines of work. So some of you, of course, have heard of him uh, as a member of the planning commission between 2009 and 14. Uh, those of you who study management obviously have some sense of the organizations that Mr. Mehra has worked for in his career. Uh, he did work in the Boston Consulting Group. He was with the Tata Group for a long period of time. But the reason why we invited him is not so much because of the fact that he had that rich experience in the private sector, but he's perhaps one of the few people who, apart from that private sector experience, also joins the government in an advisory capacity. And there are very few people who are able to move between across, across sectors and gain that sort of cross-sectoral experience within the same lifetime. The other of reason, of course, why we were very happy to have Mr. Mehra is because of the books that he's written. So uh, Mohammad Ashik, who took the initiative to invite him, who I should be grateful to for primarily setting up this talk, also was very keen that we accompany Mr. Mehra to the library and get him to sign some of the books that we happen to have, uh, which are written by him, and he kindly agreed. Uh, but for those of you who may want to look up his work and look at it more systematically, uh, Mr. Mehra, apart from contributing to many public newspapers, especially economic newspapers, has also written a range of books, especially in the last decade, which have more to do with social policy, right? So there are titles, for instance, one, the one which I, I'm a bit more familiar with is called Listening for Wellbeing, Conversations with People Not Like Us, which is, in fact, a great book for anybody, irrespective of whether you're studying law, business, or politics. Then a more recent book, which I've personally not read, but hopefully some of you would have read, Transforming Systems, Why the World Needs a New Ethical Toolkit, other titles, including Redesigning the Aeroplane While Flying, Reforming Institutions, The Learning Factory, which is a study of the internal systems in the Tata Com Group, and also a book called Solutions Factory, of which we were able to quickly locate some copies and get Mr. Mehra's signature. So I'm very happy to host Mr. Mehra in our campus uh, with the support of the students, because the Nalsar Public Policy Group had also been a little dormant over the last one year for reasons that we can discuss outside this room. But it's a good way of reactivating the group and hopefully getting a conversation going across people from different disciplinary backgrounds on how there are some common insights which we must not lose sight of even as we converge in a small educational institution like this. Ultimately, whether we are more interested in pursuing further work in the social sciences or in business or in a professional discipline like law, we must not lose sight of the problems that lie at the intersection of state institutions, economic institutions, and social institutions. That's a message that we are trying to reinforce across different courses, not just our undergraduate programs, but our master's programs, which is why I was also very keen that the students who are part of one of, at least one of my courses on economic freedoms and law should also join this gathering. But let's see if we can also identify some strands which will be relevant for our other coursework and our other ideas in the coming few years. So Mr. Mehra will possibly speak for about half an hour, and then we will have some time for discussion. Uh, like one of his book titles suggests, let's listen keenly. So over to you, Mr. Mehra. Professor Siddharth Chaudhary, thank you very much for uh, introducing me. And uh, thank you, friends, for a very enthusiastic reception. I, I do hope that I can keep you uh, engaged for the next hour in a discussion with you. I want to thank the public policy group of this the best institution for law uh, in the country. And I would say, perhaps, 
with the potential to be the most important law institution in the world. Because India has the need to create for the world better ideas of justice, of equity, of inclusion, of fairness, along with growth, economic growth. Our Prime Minister um, has appealed yesterday once again to the leaders of the G20 as they were departing, as he had pleaded with them the day before the summit started, that it's the time to find human-centric solutions that go beyond GDP. I'm a very proud Indian after this summit. Uh, I don't know what you feel, but I felt very proud of what uh, uh, India had accomplished, not just in the physical performance uh, of India, the venues, the organization, all world class, but in the achievement of getting a world which is in contention, in conflict, to start behaving as if it is indeed, as the Prime Minister said, a time not for war, but a time to make the world better for everyone. In the middle of the 85 paragraph statement of the leaders at the end of the G20, there is a very important sentence. It's sort of in the middle and hidden there, which says that at this midpoint towards the sustainable development goals, which are supposed to be accomplished by 2030, at this midpoint, the world has achieved only 12% of the goals. Friends, we have a long way to go, and if we keep going the way we are, the world is going to be getting hotter, colder, broken, more in conflict, and not a better place for, for anyone. So we have to find a new way to bring about improvement in the world. The present ways, which are described by leaders when they meet, and pompous statements about what we must achieve, those ways are not going to solve the problem. I studied physics in uh, college, and I'm very proud as an Indian that we landed something on the moon, on the other side of the moon. And we've got to find solutions on the other side, where we usually look for solutions. And Einstein, who I revered, had said that you cannot solve the big problems that you face with the same thinking that has caused the problems. So that's the spirit in which I want to engage you young people to be leaders in making the world better for everyone. It's no longer time to just talk about the need for a better world and make targets and slogans. We have to do something different to get the results that we wish to have. I'm going to start with a little survey. Here I am with, well, this is the best law institution in the country. And I said institutions of law, unlike institutions of engineering, are institutions which are engaged with these subjects of justice, of what matters to people, of how can policymakers understand what matters to people and devise then policies which would make the world better for everyone. Engineering schools don't teach you that. Something done. But the time has come not to just do it, but to pause and reflect on why we want to do it. And then how would we do it differently? So here's my survey. I want to ask, well, how many of you say that the Indian economy is doing very well? How many of you say the Indian economy is doing very well? Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. How many of you say, my goodness, the Indian economy needs to be quite different and doing much better. 
Yes. We should celebrate what we have done, but it's not going to get us there. We have to have a very different view of what a good world is, not just a large economy, but a more fair a human social system. As the Prime Minister said, it's time to find human-centric solutions that go beyond the GDP. Second question. How many believe, of you believe, that young Indians all over the country, in villages and in towns, have enough opportunities to earn decently, to earn good incomes decently? How many of you believe all Indians in this country have fair opportunities to do that? One. How many believe we must change the whole system so that Many more Indians, perhaps all young Indians, feel that they have a hope and will be immediately able to live with dignity, earn with dignity, and feel good about their lives. There you are. Now I'm going to ask you, how many of you in this room want to make India a better place for all Indians? He doesn't. Yes. 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 Have the courage to show it. Don't be shy. You will do it. You can do it. Hmm? Now, I want to share with you what I've learned in my life. And there are three stories with which I'll share my, my learnings with you. First, when I finished college, Masters in Physics, Delhi University, St. Stephen's College, considered to be the most difficult course in India to, to get admission into, and I finished in my master's and did very well. I, of course, wanted to serve the country. In those days, in the 1960s, the spirit was, we just got our independence. We are going to show the world that we need to be respected. We've been too long told that we need to be developed by the Europeans and by Britain. When Mahatma Gandhi said, if a mess has to be made here, let us make our own mess. It's our agency, it's our country, it's our future. So I wanted to serve the government because at that time in the 1960s, the only career that one could have, which was dedicated to helping making India a better place, was the IAS or the IFS. So I said, after my physics, I'll learn some history and do three papers in history and two papers in physics. And of course, like all my other peers in St. Stephen's College, I also shall be in government. And that's what I want to do. However, unfortunately, I was a little too young to sit for that exam. I had to pass these uh, two years before I could sit for the exam which was fortunate, so I could study history by reading, political science by reading. Hmm? Uh, and, but at the time, the principal of the college said, our college, St. Stephen's, is a, becoming a very attractive place for the big businesses of the country at that time, which are all multinationals. Hindustan Lever, Metal Box, ICI, They're looking for leaders. And you know, they tell the college, you got some good people with good backgrounds, and you send them to us. So he said, why don't you go and interview with these people? And I said, I don't want to work with business. I want to serve the country. So he said, have you been to Calcutta? Have you been to Bombay? Have you been to Madras, as it was called? I said, no. He said, they're going to pay you to travel first class train put you up in five-star hotels, give you a nice lunch at an interview, and, and you'll get a job. What's wrong with that? Let me see the country that you want to serve. So I did go to these interviews. And I was convinced after that that business really wasn't connected with our country. It really wasn't connected with our country. I was offered a job by, it was the most lucrative private sector job available in the country with a tea-broking firm. 
the wasn't I mean, it's an unlimited partnership. We won't take the name. And I got without an interview really selected because I'd been sent from wherever I was sent from. Um, and the person then met me, gave me a nice thing for a few minutes, and then said, um, let me show you around our tea tasting room. So he took me around, and I saw people in white gowns who looked like him only, standing and tasting some tea. And then we came back, and he said, well, here's your offer letter. So the offer letter was a salary, which was about five times the salary of a government servant, which I would have got to the IAS. It was a salary which also included every three years, six months furloughed to go home, which was visiting England, which is where these English people were coming from, paid for passage, as well as a membership of two clubs in Calcutta. I mean, as a young person coming out of college, something. But I asked him, sir, what is the work I will do? He said, work? I showed you. You will come in the morning. Oh, by the way, he said, I hope you don't drink tea. Fortunately, at that time, I hadn't yet learned how to drink tea because that's one thing. You can drink alcohol and do what you like and smoke, but no drinking tea because your taste buds must be OK. Uh, that's what you'll do. You'll come here for one hour. We'll give you different things, and you'll give your opinions on them. Then we all have lunch together. I'll show you the executive lunch room. And then you go and do siesta, and then you go play golf or do what you like. So I suppose you're, it's OK with you. I said, may I think about it? He'd never heard this answer before. And I realized then that I didn't want to make more money for myself. It's the work that mattered. What would the fulfillment I get by tasting tea every day and being paid such a huge salary? However, one interview was in Bombay with the Tata Group. And there I was interviewed, along with four or five other people, by the directors of the Tata Group for three days. And they kept just listening to us, asking us, making us discuss and listen to us. Uh, and I wondered, you're not asking me any tough questions, like how many ships are there in the Indian Navy, like I was asked in, when I went to Calcutta. I mean, general knowledge questions, no. Just me, what I care about, what have I learned, why am I interested in that? And they said to me in the final interview, which they had one-on-one, -on -one, that we know that you are not interested in joining the private sector because you want to serve the country. Let us tell you what Mahatma Gandhi said about Jamshedji Tata, the founder of the Tata Group. Mahatma Gandhi said that when he was fighting for India's political freedom, Jamshedji Tata was fighting for India's economic freedom. He wanted to create enterprises built by Indians and to show the world that we can do it as well as you. And in that process, young Indians would develop themselves to be leaders of a new India through working with industry. This attracted me the spirit of it and the opportunity to learn to do something which India didn't know. And I would learn along with them. So friends, that was my first uh, uh, story with you. And it ended with, you see, talking about uh, Mahatma Gandhi, as they said. Gandhiji had made that statement, which was the inspiration for policymakers, that when you think of any new policy that you want to make, or have designed the policy. Think of what benefits it will give to the poorest person that you can imagine or that you know. And give those benefits now, because they need them now. So Tata seemed to be in that spirit. So I joined Tata and served 25 happy years. But as I said, I really had, as a young person, aspiration to, I wanted to be a big government officer maybe a minister someday. But time had passed. I went to the Boston Consulting Group, consultant back to businesses abroad and here, and taught them how to make more money and to become larger multinationals, including Indian companies. And time to retire, hang up my boots at 65. When I get a call the day I've retired and from 
the Prime Minister's office, and I don't know him, I didn't think he would know me, that uh, uh, may the Prime Minister speak with you? And I said, yes, on hoax call. This will be less hoax calls those days. Um, and his voice, which I would recognize, a very nice, quiet, gentle voice from Manmohan Singh, said, uh, Mr. Myra Harun, would you like to serve the country? Now, tell me, if after itne saano ke baad, someone asks you the question which you've been having in your heart since 50 years, I automatically said, yes, sir. <laughs> he said, I'm inviting you to be a, a member of the planning commission, which is a ministerial level position. Uh, would you accept it? What would you say? Ask him, sir, salary kitni milti hai? Holidays kitne milte hai? No, sir. I'm here with you. So I did join the planning commission, but after asking him, I said, sir, you sure you're not making a mistake? I'm not an economist, and I've never done any work in the government. He said, that's why I'm inviting you. We've got enough economists and enough people who've been working in government, and we are not getting solutions for this country right. So I want you to come and listen and observe us and yourself. What is it that we are doing we should not continue doing? And what is a different way that we should help the country to become a good country for, for everybody? The situation then was that India was doing very poorly. We were the fastest growing economy just behind China at the time. Today, of course, we are pipping China also. So we used to declare that India shining because our growth rates were uh, so high. But a study done, it's called the SIDA, the Sustainable Economic Development Assessment Framework, which compares all countries of the world with respect to, with each unit of GDP growth, how much damage are they causing the environment and how much inclusion are they creating for their own uh, citizens? And the inclusion was very largely through opportunities that people have to earn well and with dignity and with you know, social security. And the environment were other indicators like overuse of groundwater, depleting water tables, pollution in the air, green cover depletion. Friends, we said, look, look, don't compare us to Scandinavia and don't compare us to uh, Canada, richer countries with a lot of resources. Uh, compare us to countries like ourselves. So out of that framework, they chose the BRICS countries as well as the countries of our neighborhood, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan. Yes, Pakistan too and Southeast Asian countries. We were horrified that India was at the bottom of that table at that time, even below Pakistan, below Nepal. Yes, our growth was fastest, but since we had the largest population of young people in the world, we needed to have the highest employment elasticity. It means that every unit of growth, you create more jobs. Our growth had the least employment elasticity. It was creating some jobs and growth through returns on capital, but not enough opportunities for uh, this demographic dividend that we were hoping to realize. So I joined the planning commission and my grandson, who was uh, seven at the time, he lives in the United States uh, where my son works, and he had come to India some five years, I mean, two years before I joined the Planning Commission, and he had noticed as a five-year-old the poverty in the streets of same Luton's Delhi where we've had a lovely G20 summit. And driving around, it's, it's, Luton's Delhi is a lovely place. It's, it's almost as nice as your campus. <laughs> it's green, white streets, and nice buildings, and lots of lovely big cars going around, which you don't have here. And he just noticed that there were things, people there living quite unlike the people he sees in the United States, you know, sleeping on the sides of the road, children running around, playing with each other on the side of the road, 
women cooking on the side in Luton's Delhi. And he said, why are they doing this? So his mother explained, you know, they're poor. This is a poor country. We are a rich country. In America, you're lucky. He came back two years later, uh, seven years old, and we happened to be driving in the same area. And this time I was in my government car with red light and a flag on it and, uh, and so And he was sitting in the back with me and my son with the driver in the front. And we drive the same area. And suddenly this voice, which is now a bigger voice, exploded. He says, what's the government doing about it? Counting daisies? Start. Just then, no, not, he doesn't know, the planning commission was trying to prove by reports and statistics that we were well above the poverty line by counting the numbers of people who were no longer poor. Hmm? Like now we are saying, oh, there are enough people employed. Look at all the statistics. Every, I've got a packet full of, in the last one week, arguments among statisticians, some are pro and some are anti the government, trying to prove or not whether enough good jobs are being created in the country. And we know they aren't. So here's Viren saying, what's the government doing about it counting daisies? So my son turned and said, what do you mean counting daisies? Like I would say. He said, there's so many more poor people. Can't the government see? <laughs> so my son said, Viren, now Dadaji's government. So he looked at me and said, this man who plays around with me, what government? So I explained to him that I work in the planning commission. Now what would he understand about the planning commission? So I took him to the planning commission office where there's a lovely huge office with three chaprasis and, and two drivers and all the government. You know, because I'm doing a, it was almost as good as what that company had offered me in Calcutta. <laughs> or better this way, but except I didn't have any furlough to go back to England. Virin went back to his school and his school system, the American school system as a seven-year-old, all the people were told to please write a page or an essay on what you did during your summer holiday. And Virin wrote an essay on the Planning Commission of India. And in that essay, which is 14 pages with his childlike scroll and some pictures he drew of stick men, was the last page which says the planning community you forgot it's a commission. The planning community is a place. And the picture showed a big desk and a man behind the desk, Bobby's Dadaji, and a very sticky man, you know, stick like man bowing with his hands folded. The planning community is a place where all the poor people of India can come. And there will be someone there to listen to them. There will be someone there to listen to them. And then they will not be poor anymore. That's really struck me. How by listening to somebody do you take away their poverty? One very obvious thing is people are not numbers. You really listen to their perception of their condition. Their feeling about the lack of respect and opportunity that they have. You will understand what poverty is. The second very important thing is if you Give someone the respect of listening to them and not trying to tell them that they are uneducated. And let me tell you why you should not be feeling so poor. And let me tell you all the good things that we are doing for you, which is no respect. Just giving person the respect that your perspective is as important as mine. So you mentioned about listening my book. This, I think, is the most profound, important lesson. The third story, <clears throat> which I'll end with, is where I came back to India in, uh, after my 10, 11 years in the United States, where I was, as I said, consulting to international companies, their CEOs, their boards, uh, to India, with great concern that uh, my country is really not, it's done very well for me, I've got all this is not doing very well. Uh, so many are Indians, like myself, from public sector, from private sector, education sector, social sector, as individuals very concerned about the direction our country was going with, you know, chase growth, growth, growth. And so we agreed to just listen to each other. Our perspectives on what is happening really and what needs to 
the new form of of working together to create growth that is good for everybody. So that was eight or nine months of research, which included papers provided to us by educational people about the state of the education system, papers provided to us by environmental scientists and hydrologists and so on. But most of it was actually listening to the people in groups and workshops, and they're listening to each other. Teachers from rural schools, slum children or street children from Delhi who were struggling with the assistance of some NGOs to at least go to some classes uh, in school while they continue to live on the streets. So these people we heard from and the children themselves who came and performed a play for us to tell us in their language and their words, Yamara Bharat. But they had spirit and hope. That was the surprising part. But we could see we weren't doing justice uh, for them. So at the end of it, we said, let's see what is our answer to these two questions. What is the process of transformation which will bring about inclusive growth, where everyone feels that they have agency, they're part of creating a better India, not just being recipients to policies which are not working. Models of transformation. And within the models of transformation, who are the leaders in those models of transformation? So four pictures were produced to summarize it, because you can produce tables and data and stuff. Yeah, you're learning tables and data and stuff. But when you want to connect different sorts of data, there has to be a narrative. Underlying what is happening. So pictures and narratives put together a picture of complexity. Four pictures. They're all four are pictures of the process of transformation and the form of leadership that is required in that process of transformation. The first picture was of big buffaloes wallowing in a pond. And on the side of the pond was a little child. You know, those days we were all saying malnutrition, education, the beneficiaries of those would be those children. And we've got all these policymakers and all talking about food and agriculture and growth and, and reform of higher education, all policymakers. And the story goes below that these buffaloes are who we consider to be the leaders. Badi minister hai, neta hai, big chaps. They are not able to cooperate with each other. When one feels that I've got a solution, gets up, the others around don't in the pond cooperate, so he can't get out of the pond also. He will be settled down. Then another says, no, I got the way. Then when he gets up, the first one says, you didn't cooperate with me. No, I'm not going to cooperate with you. So all the buffaloes are wallowing in the pond, and the poor children and the people of India are waiting for, please, can you find new solutions and work together for our sake? So the leaders are important people in big positions. The second picture was a picture of how India had become after 1991, where we had begun to worship GDP, begin to respect wealth, not to respect may not be right, but admire wealth. And I came back to India after 11 years. When I left in 1989, the front page of the Times of India every day had a cartoon by R.K. Lakshman, which was the common man's view. By the time I came back, poor R.K. Lashman was still there because he was still alive. But page three of the Times of India was a new page called page three, in which there were pictures of people arriving at the Taj and wearing Bukati this and that, and who was at the party and drinking toasts and stuff. It was OK now to be rich. In fact, you were celebrated for being, being rich. So there was a change. Look after yourself, and thereby, somehow, the world will be better for everybody. And that's the theory of the trickle down. Yeah? And so the picture here was, there's a big peacock in a courtyard. Around it are some pigeons, a little respectful distance, distance. And at the fringe are little sparrows cowering. And some grain has been thrown open into the courtyard, which is what we said. When you throw open the market, there's opportunity for everybody, right? So you grain are the opportunities. The person who already has the wherewithal 
to grab opportunities because they got more wealth already to invest, or they already have a much better education, or they have more access to power, will take advantage of the new opportunities. So the peacock is getting fatter and fatter. The pigeons can get a little bit of grains on the side, the middle class, for middle class. And the poor sparrows are waiting. So you see, who are the leaders then? We were celebrating Elon Musk type of people as current such type people as so they are changing the world. The third picture was of a, a tiger in a forest, and there's some wolves also just keeping the distance and little squirrels climbing up the trees. And this is a picture of transformation with force where the leaders are the people who have the muscle to frighten and intimidate everybody to come on. Okay? We know this model. The poor people, the weakest people are the ones who suffer the most. The people around the very powerful guy might get safely uh, something. So three models of leaders, force, big knowledge maybe, position, and the third is a lot of wealth. Read the stories that you read about leaders. Yeah, either one or this or the other. The, no hope, no hope. But the fourth model, which came out of studying how change is actually being brought about on the ground, was a picture of a dark night in which little fireflies are rising. Jugnu. And you begin to see hope, possibilities. Who are fireflies? They are little things which with their own light just decide to rise. And when many rise together, darkness turns to light. The fireflies are leaders in a new, better model of transformation. It's not top down. All the other three are top down. So friends, here you are. Hmm? You're setting out on your journey of life. What shall you do? You said to me, you all want to, all of you want to make India a better place for, for everyone. I would say the lessons I've learned in life is be curious. Just ask, why is it happening? And when you get an answer to, oh, this is why it's happening, then why is that happening? Oh, that's why that is happening. But then why is that happening? Get down to the fundamentals. Why, why, why? At all times. Don't accept data as complete information. Listen to real people. Go to real places, or at least listen to real people about their real places. And therefore, most of all, Learn to listen to people not like yourself. Our country and the world are being torn apart by people who believe that they are better, the US, than China. Some communities in India compared to other communities. And we're tearing ourselves apart. I'm glad that this room has 50-50 women and men, that diversity is here. I'm sure that in this room there's other diversities also in terms of the ways you think, your backgrounds, where you come from in this country. Uh, where you think is most importantly the big difference in ourselves. So look around every week and make it a demand on yourself that I'm going to go out and meet with somebody, listen to somebody, who I've just instinctively not been listening to, avoiding. Social media will not help you here, because it'll keep giving you information and tweets by people who think like you. Put off your phones. Thank you, Mama. During the COVID time, this terrific advertisement, or before, before COVID, this was when we had the anti-corruption and the feminist movement in India, Nirbhaya case. And uh, this was, uh, I think, Cafe Coffee Day, which put out this ad. Hmm? Stand up for this, stand up for that. Are you sit down and let's talk, yaar. Hmm? But the Cafe Coffee Day was also advertised that you will have complete Wi-Fi. <laughs> and when you saw people that I would see, they would be all be sitting, though they are all together, all looking into their own phones. Yeah. Let's talk, yaar. 
Let's listen to each other. And it's not about talking, it's about listening. Communication is a two-way process. We learn how to tweet smartly and make our point across. How to show myself off in TikTok in how many seconds? It's all about projecting myself. That's what one learns about communication in the modern world. We've forgotten how to even listen. So that I wish there was a prize. I'm sure you said there's a prize for best debaters, best elocutionists. And my friend is says that your institution is doing very well. I wish you were to give a prize every week, or every semester, for the best listener amongst us. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have some time, 10 to 15 minutes, to have a discussion or ask some questions. So uh, I like the fact that Mr. Mehra kept the discussion very biographical, uh, largely about experiences in his life. And uh, given that in a residential campus, you're largely living with people in your own age group, and there's a sort of formal interaction with middle-aged people like us, uh, sometimes listening to a person from the older generation has its own value. And um, while many of you, of course, have been in this campus for some time, there are also some first year students. And I do recall that as a college student, especially when you come to a residential institution of a national character, uh, the first few weeks can be quite disorienting. Um, somebody who was perhaps head boy, head girl, the apple of their parents eyes, uh, suddenly is thrown into an environment where they feel that they're in the midst of sharks, right? So that's a pretty common experience. Uh, it's not particular to you. It pretty much happens in every educational institution that has a selective character. So you feel that your peers are judging you in a hostile environment. It seems you have given up your privacy. And obviously, the initial few months can be quite disorienting. For some people, that disorientation can have a long-term effect. And one of the reasons I feel uh, those problems of college adjustment or college shock are perhaps getting worse uh, in the last few years is actually the issue which Mr. Mehra is addressing, that many of us across age groups have just lost the ability to listen. Uh, it's true for most of us who are professional lecturers. We generally go into the room, we say something. If you've taught a course a few times, you repeat it 10 times, 20 times, 30 times, 40 times. <laughs> That's a teaching career. But for most of you who are still finding yourselves uh, still trying to figure out what your long-term plan is going to be, uh, very often the immediate tendency is to assert your point, put forward your position, and think that things will happen on their own. And like many of you are realizing, of course, our own internal campus issues we can discuss separately, things don't get solved just by asserting yourself or making grand statements, right, or holding your view in an aggressive way. In the long term, if you want to get things done, whether it is organizing a program, whether it is making a constructive change in policy, whether it is about reforming yourselves, it requires a daily adherence. And daily adherence is not just about the personal discipline that you might develop with respect to any academic or co-curricular activity that you might have, but a very crucial part of that would be also absorbing the experiences of people who are very different from you. So in a way, Mr. Mehra is reinforcing an idea, which of course is relevant for us at different stages of our life, but I think more so for people who are living in small residential campuses like this, where it's very easy to get trapped either in the echo chamber of your own voice or the echo chamber that we may create with friends or people who think exactly like us. And one of the challenges of higher education, some of you are here this year, some of you might be in more prestigious universities in the future, some of you might pursue higher education at a later point in time. You will realize that when you are exposed to cross-cultural environments, it is in fact very hard sometimes to strike up conversations with people who A, may not speak the language that you speak, may come with a very different set of assumptions, and you somehow have to find a way to overcome that initial hesitation 
and get the conversation going. So I personally learned it with my postgraduate experience, where in spite of the confidence of the first degree and in spite of the confidence of the first job, the moment you're thrown into a multicultural environment, the very assumptions that you make right, about your own social capital can sometimes come crashing down. And for many of you, those moments will come. Those moments will come as you progress in your lives. So I think what Mr. Mehra is saying is, of course, gleaned from a lifetime of experience. But there are ideas which, of course, can be discussed at a more abstract level in terms of problems that you're examining in your studies. But also there are insights which we can draw and apply to our own personal lives. So I'm very grateful to Mr. Mehra for putting it very gently and putting it in a biographical way. Because many of us who are full-time teachers tend to be didactic. We are a little bit in your face. And then, of course, there is, of course, a power dynamic here. So uh, if any student wants to ask a specific question, um, it doesn't exactly have to be just about the talk. Uh, even a generic question about the books that Mr. Mehra has written or the previous work that he's done, we have a few minutes. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, just raise your hand, and we can collect a few questions. Right, Ronak, anybody else? Right, Jagyasa, anybody else? Two more hands. So let's, uh, you can just step up. I think we have another mic here. Hello, hello. It doesn't have a battery. It doesn't have a battery. That's fine. So hello, you can hello, just pass around that mic. Yeah. Just passing there. Good evening, sir. Uh, thank you so much for uh, ha coming here and addressing. I've been following your LinkedIn uh, for a qu quite some time now. So, and to have you speak with us, it's been quite an honor, sir. Uh, so, I want to know. I mean, you come. Uh, I'm a business student here as well in Alsa. So, um, I mean, the er er realm of consulting, working in potentially working in BCG, then going on to uh, the planning commission. These are all very aspirational dreams that maybe some some capacity if we can reach that reality is something definitely we all aspire to. So, but uh, so but when we uh, talking to the coming to the talk that we had uh, discussed here today, a lot of uh, change that was talked about was uh, the emphasis was brought uh, to be a little more bottom bottom up approach. However, when it comes to the planning commission or be it consulting also in the larger sense within the domain of management. It is a lot of, from what in my understanding, is a lot of top-down approach. So how do we strike a balance when we see that there is, even with the issue of jobless growth in India, especially in the 90s and coming here, there is the understanding that the when it comes to implementation of a said policy towards the bottom, it never gets there. So I mean, so how do we get from um, mechanisms that are set which facilitate a top uh, top down approach to uh, facilitating change with a bottom up approach are you a teacher of yes, sir i'm a second year student yeah what did you do before uh, so this is my undergraduate degree sir. okay yes what are you aspiring to do uh, i hope to go into public policy sir public policy yes sir and you are in the school of management yes sir uh, actually we have an ipm program here so yes i'm part of that sir. Yes. No, this is a discussion that we had with the Vice Chancellor and with the Siddharth that um, um, for the last uh, 20 years, um, like for me too, uh, management, business management became to be the admired way of doing anything. And governments were being told that they better work like a business. Right? And this is a personal story. The CEOs, I'm sorry, the heads of government would feel proud to be called the CEO of their country. Davos, which was the place where people met to change the world. Chandra Babu Naidu went twice, talked about himself as the CEO of Andhra Pradesh, and the CI put him up. You know what happens and what happened. He said this honestly, and I was here and, and with him, met him. He said, I don't want to be close to business again. Because the people will not trust me anymore. Okay, So we're coming to trust. Why should someone trust you if you're not even listening to that person? He says, trust me. I know what's good for you. Trust me. I know how to do it right. 
it's not happening the fellow says i can see it around me i will stop trusting you i mean because you're the power i have no other option but to take it but i don't trust trust is the quality that enables people to have relationships without legal contracts and for a law school is important to say what how are relationships built in which people will feel it's fair to both sides and there's justice being done without having to formulate it <laughs> into a legal contract business runs on legal contracts it's supposed to be accurate efficient appealable in a court of law and many of you will want even from the law school to go and become corporate lawyers i'm just asking you to consider this that that is the way that we have to say we talked of balance one is not saying do away with this and cause an arc but there's too much of this and too little of that so what would you do while you are in business spend more time listening to the others than trying to find solutions for them let's take i think there were some more comments on it right good evening sir uh you talked about the success story of little louder you talked about the success story of amul model of amul amul i when did i talk about it today not in this talk at least no. okay yeah. the uh, success of copper i have system. many times yes <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes now uh, can there be a possibility of cooperative conglomerate system in india like mondragon corporation of uh, spain or uh, if there is not such scenario then what are the barriers like legal barriers socio political barriers and in the uh, current purview of so before we go to spain let's say you do believe like i do you know there was something in that process the farmers owning their own buffaloes the women milking their own buffaloes and a large enterprise grew out of it that large enterprise a of course has produced benefits for all these people all the producers of milk right the incomes have gone up the large enterprise has been able to compete with hindustan lever in almost everything big multinational so this is successful model of an enterprise which produces benefits for the people you said cooperative and the key lies there there's a legal definition of what is a cooperative and that is what's begun to go wrong we talked about it that we say that <clears throat> two things one is that let's make this cooperative more efficient to any enterprise a, a business manager knows how to make things more efficient he doesn't know how to make them equitable so we've started to get into our social enterprises not just amul business management consultants to help them improve their processes to produce more efficiency so there's more surplus produced upwards which i'm going to be a little uh, philosophical gandhi ji said that i don't respect the soviet model of communism and i don't respect capitalism why in the soviet model of communism it is believed that there's no asset that belongs to any private person they belong to everybody but the state on behalf of everybody is managing those assets working inside the soviet union or a soviet factory was no different in some ways better some ways worse than working inside henry ford's factories as he pointed out so it is your sense of agency and the worth of your own work that you live your life in so those systems of organization are the same henry ford and taylor since you're a management student were consultants to stalin and the soviet union do you know this and they helped the soviet union to very soon much poorer country than the us to be able to produce things at the same scale as the as the us could the system of organization was the same that system of organization in the soviet union as the west says was depriving people of their agency and as many are saying look this capitalist system always has deprived people of their agency you are inside that factory 
to do as you're told. You're given a little piece of the work to do. You're not creating anything. You're doing the same thing repetitively. So what is your life worth? So when we come into then Amul, again, organizations like that, when you get someone who doesn't quite understand what is the purpose of the enterprise and what must be the philosophy of this enterprise, which management and business people don't, because they're not brought up for that, you begin to destroy the enterprise. Second, when you say that if things are made more legal, contracts in the cooperative, a more legal form, it will then be somehow more just. The communist system has got everything laid down in terms of rule, and so has the US justice system. But neither of them are feeling just to the people. So come back to say, the fireflies again. We alone. I alone can't do something enough. I do need some other bits. People not necessarily doing the same thing as me, but doing adjacent things. So we together make an enterprise. So Gandhiji's idea, the village must work like one community, like one system. And if every village was environmentally sustainable, if every village community was socially harmonious, then the world will be socially harmonious and environmentally sustainable. So the SDGs about which I referred. The last 17th goal says partnerships. You need partnerships for environment. You need partnerships for education. You need partnerships for public health, the other goals. But we're using the word partnerships. Remember what I said about uh, our prime minister or our vision, one earth one family, one future. Not one earth, one economy, one future. Legal forms of institution, like cooperatives, <laughs> are so that they are understandable by markets. They are legally justiciable. And I like what you said to these young people, that you're having differences unintendedly amongst yourselves. There's a different way to make ourselves into a more harmonious, a friendly community uh, in this place. So I'm answering it in a very philosophical way. But the time has come, my friends, to step out of looking at forms as the lawyers tell us they should be, or as business people tell us the processes should be. Say, what's the purpose of it all? What is the purpose of it all? Let's step back and re-describe. Remember, SDGs, we are only 12% towards goals, halfway up. And after that, as I told some people yesterday when they asked, uh, do you celebrate what we have achieved? I said, of course, I really do. But what I'm concerned about, the next three things that you have planned to do is to gather again all the financial institutions and tell them to change how they work so that they'll be better off to people. Of course, they won't do it. They can't. <laughs> Get the people together. Forget them. Don't argue against them. Make a force here. Yeah? Support each other. Then each of you will, along with others, be feeling stronger and better. Otherwise, you'll have to keep appealing to Sadar, sir. The boys were right or the girls were right. I don't know if there's a dispute over here. Whatever it is. I went to St. Stephen's College. I joined as a freshman. It was the worst ragging in the whole country. For two months, stripped and made to do things which are horrible. But they were proud. That's the way in a tough place it has to be. It hardly has changed. We're still having suicides. So it's up to us. I mean, this ragging and bullying is not being done by him. We are doing it to each other. Why? And the fact that it was done to you last year and therefore you'll do it this year, it's very much like the way the wars go on. You came last time, this time I'll teach you something. Just this respect the needs of each other. Actually, my point was that uh, most of the businesses still in India. I can't hear you. Most of the business houses, most of the business houses in India are still family run, and uh, if the cooperative system uh, get more robustly implemented, 
now this trickle down theory of the economy might get changed no property how... system please nine tenths of the law is property rights okay we are now discovering as human humanity there's something called human rights human rights was never part of any law till about 100 years or 150 years ago human rights what is the right of every human being equally even in the us when they say that all men all men are equal in liberty women came later and the blacks also later what is the right of every human being this the law has not accepted what it means and how it could be then cooperatively implemented we know property rights so that's the whole basis of business whole basis we believe because there was some economist who said harden the tragedy of the commons that unless something belongs to somebody it will never be taken care of and that is the whole problem that's come about privatization of public goods but unless is given to someone privately to to run a school or to run a hospital it will not be run efficiently but for whose sake our best hospitals in hyderabad they have catered to people who fly in but we are saying public health access in india even just outside the city of hyderabad it's very very poor same for education so this notion that property rights if people get clear property rights some of the world will be better for for everyone just think about it just think about it no no i think your question came from a narrower frame you were trying to say how would cooperatives be superior to family run businesses but i think mr mehra's response is asking you to question yes. the legal formulation of cooperatives because legal formulations of cooperatives may not coincide with a social understanding of cooperation so in a way it's a response to you which is not perhaps a direct engagement with your question but is asking you to interrogate what we mean by the idea of cooperation and whether it is a legal form or an economic form the underlying principle is what we should focus on and siddharth thank you for that you know i deliberately would say the same thing i want us to go to the fundamentals what is the point of it all what's the point of having a cooperative even mm. you see so you come back to what do i care about most what do i want to see most of all in the world then say maybe the cooperative is a wrong idea i don't know but start with what is the design of the institution that will fulfill what we have in mind it will produce dignity for all it will produce in everybody the sense that i have an equal say in where this enterprise is is going if that is so then what would be the design the formal processes required to enable that to happen and slipping into these two modes that we know one of them is formal law the law is beginning to question itself and saying supreme court who shall decide what the people want in terms of sex parliament says we are elected by the people we shall decide no but there's a fundamental right here well what is the fundamental right the us supreme court is struggling with the same question so we the people we the people it's we the people not any one of us on behalf of the people we the people must say this is what we want and so is the consensus amongst us laterally vertical processes of giving justice and forming policy are by design wrong they are not about we right okay i think uh, since we have a limited time there were a couple of hands here let's take them let's pass on the mic there yeah we'll take two questions together because yeah i, I think there is one two three let's take all three together right a very good evening sir my name is mayank and i am a first year student of parknal sir so my like i had a basic question like what how was how were your experiences when you worked with india's planning commission and what differences did you find when you were working as a consultant with international corporations second question uh, good evening sir my name is soej and i am first year blb student of nasa i had a question regarding planning commission also but i had a question regarding as a policy making person for you so for example you said there need to be equality also in the growth of the nation but uh, suppose if politically a leader wants for i'm using an example here if there are two, two choices between a political leader first having a 50 story story uh, building 
uh, of any industry or all, or, have, or developing something that might help 50 people's life. But for making sure that he stays in power and making sure that his propaganda of development is being shown, he chooses the 50 story building. So how does the planning commission as a member, you try to balance to making sure that there was growth, but there was equality also in that growth. Thank you. Uh, there's a lady there. Uh, hello, sir. My name is Mehreen Mandir and I'm a fifth year law student here. And um, I actually had the opportunity to intern with BCG the last November December, and I was working in the social impact group. And one of the things that I've been reading for the past six, seven months is the development of a parallel bureaucracy led by consultants, wherein consultants are involved very heavily into governance and public policy making, which is affecting the state's capacity to do so. And there's benefits to, of course, the consultants being there, which is efficiency and expertise. But it is also severely impairing the way states' capacity is being built over the years and how in some ways, you know, like you also mentioned in his answer that while they are talking about efficiency and the state then becomes the equitable or the advocacy for equitability, but somehow it, it's then presented at loggerheads. So how do you as someone who's been on both ends understand the impact of consultants entering the space and how the state's capacities are built? Because I feel like you'll be the best person to you know, answer this sort of a question. Okay, uh, I'm going to answer with two stories, very short ones. Um, Bill, Bill Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the largest philanthropic uh, organization in the world, where they take a lot of interest personally in getting down to the ground, studying, sending expert people to help education systems in Bihar, health systems in Bihar, all over the world, Africa and so on. Bill Gates was uh, uh, in, interviewed uh, in a public gathering in the Jawaharlal Nehru uh, library by Pratap Bhanu Mehta, who probably you read. And this is when I was in the planning commission. And uh, so Bill Gates was being admired and feted. You know, you in Bihar and, and so, and the question Pratap asked him, maybe he was teasing him, but he asked him sincerely, was that, um, <clears throat> You know, you're proving that the government sector for years in Bihar has never been able to perform. You're proving that it's better to leave it to the private sector. Yeah, means your sales philanthropy from the private sector. And he stopped with that. He said, wait a minute. The greatest disservice I could do to the citizens of any place is to make them lose faith and trust in their own government. No, no, I'm not trying to do that. But then he asked, he said, do I come across like that? And Pratap therefore probably asked him, he said to the whole world, it comes across, maybe not you personally, Bill, but of course it's him, that the private sector is here to do things which the government cannot do. Coming to this question about uh, CEOs and the uh, government uh, officers, I learned when I went to the planning commission, everyone said, you're from the private sector, you know how to help people run large corporations, teach us to do it. I said, look, I'm realizing that working in public policy where you're appointed by the people, elected by the people is quite different than being a CEO appointed from above where you have the authority to hire, fire, and impose what you believe is the strategy. So the model of leadership in the private sector because of the construct, the legal construct of that corporation where you're legally required to serve the property interests of your investors. I've been on the boards of the largest companies here in India, advising people on the boards of companies abroad. This is always the dilemma in corporate governance. If they dare to suggest that, they will start investing more of their money to improve lives of people who can't pay much. Their shareholders will throw them out. Larry Fink. The CEO of BlackRock, which is the largest investment group in the whole world, which has some $7 trillion under its management, has for a few years been saying ESG, please the corporate world, financial world, respect environment, social, and governance indicators, not just your uh, revenues and, and profits. He is now in the US having to live on his ranch with security around him. Why? People are threatening that you're disrupting 
the natural way the world should be. If you have been given someone's money to manage, they've given it to you to make profits for them. They haven't given you their money to go and do good in the world. So the construction of the corporation requires a certain form of leadership. And you can get away with it. If you are really honestly representing the people, well, in elections, and therefore your question about buildings and stuff, you can banal the people by saying, look what we've done. Look what we've done. But then the people, once they get over that great glory, say, Ghar mein khana nahi hai. my son wants a job, is not able to. Yes, we are a great country because we got all this. Hmm? But how does the food come on the table at the end of the day? So propaganda is easier when you can give people images of, we have done this. They also feel good, but say, what did I get out of it? So coming to the planning commission, one moment saying this may be my last thing, um, had asked me that since you're an outsider, you must tell us what we must change of the planning commission. And since my grandson has teased me and got it for me right, and looking at, therefore, how the private sector did things, both as advisors, consultants to the government, as well as themselves, and how the government needed to do things but was not, I did say, and we recommended by listening and learning and getting all the international world banks to tell us if we had to be different in our governance, what would we do with the planning commission? And our report, which we gave to Manmohan Singh, was abolish the planning commission, make it something else. Mr. Modi did, on the 15th of August, 2014, Independence Day, my first big bold act, he said, is abolish the planning commission. All economists and, you know, Top-down thinker said, how, how will the country run itself? It's so complicated, the planning commission. But that's the point. When it's more complicated, you better leave it to many people to manage their little places. You can't manage one size fits all over here. So the Niti Ayog's charter, please read it. It's very good. What does it say? But we are not implementing the charter fully, though we've gone a long way. Why not? Because the theories of how things are done and the people being appointed to those positions, that is how they've learned it. But it is changing, hardly enough. And the point again comes, we are losing time, friends. We know that we have to have a different way. And you young people who still haven't learned and become successful in the old ways, please don't copy our ways. Don't learn from us. Learn yourselves. Ask yourself these fundamental questions. Why are things happening like this? Well, they're happening like that because of the way we are doing things. So how would we do them differently? And I, in my small way, in my life, in whatever I do, I will start to apply those principles. I can't change the world completely. I have to live in the world as it is. So that's why my book, Redesigning an Aeroplane While You're Flying in It, that is what we feel, you see. I have to change this, but if I get it wrong, everybody and me is going to crash. So how do I, we together, change safely? the institutions around ourselves. I think, sir, we'll have to close there. Uh, and uh, obviously, <laughs> with the younger audience, uh, there will be some who will be engaging. Some maybe will take time to gather what was discussed. Uh, but I thank you again for visiting Nalsar and making time for us.